Morning, everybody. It's a good crowd. Um, so here's the truth. Uh, I begin the talks at conferences like this the same way a lot of the time. I'll just tell it, I'm going to begin with you guys the same way too. I've been able to make the same prediction about cybersecurity ever since I started in it back in 1995 when I was the number six prosecutor at the Department of Justice doing exclusively cybercrime and intellectual property. Now, back then it wasn't CSIP, it wasn't the Computer Crime and Intellectual Property section. It was the Computer Crime Unit of the General Litigation and Legal Advice section of the Criminal Division of the Department of Justice. And for those of you who've been in government know, the longer the name, the less important it is, right? <laughs> uh, but back then, I could have sat before you, or stood before you, and said, next year, things will be worse. In 1996, I could have stood before you and said, next year things will be worse. That is true every year until now. And I stand here before you today telling you, next year things will be worse. I am confident in telling you that I will stand here a year from now and tell you, next year things will be worse. In fact, I'm pretty confident for at least five years, maybe ten, that I can be able to make that prediction. So what does all that mean? That means that our strategy is not working. We do not have an approach that addresses the challenges of the internet. I'll tell you why. <clears throat> I think there are two interrelating and interrelated problems that are driving the difficulties that we face that kind of go up to everything, and they are the problems of scale and complexity. So when I talk about these three things, I like to, or these two things, I like to talk about three factors. So what's driving the increase of risk on the internet? Everybody likes alliteration, especially recovering lawyers like me. Um, so I say complexity, connectivity, and criticality. So let's start with connectivity. It, we're putting more and more devices on the internet and they all are internet connected. They're all connected to each other. They all have lots of vulnerabilities and lots of bad stuff is happening. And that's even before. That, I mean, that's true historically. That's even before we got to the internet of things. And if you were scared before, you should be very scared now with the internet of things or the internet of everything and what's happening generally across the entire spectrum from consumer grade cameras up through industrial control systems. Uh, the second thing is complexity. Right, so each of those things, it's not just that they've got a NIC, they've got a, you know, a network interface card on them. They're running software. You, know, it's, you, don't, you don't buy a baby monitor anymore. You buy a camera connected to a computer. And you know, that computer can do anything anything else can do. And it's running, probably in the background, a full operating system. You know, we've got washing machines and refrigerators that are web servers. Because it's just easier and cheaper for that device to communicate through a web server than anything else. So we've got this massive web of things, all of which are interrelated, all of which are talking. And we have trouble dealing with the, 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 the complication of one device. When we hook all of these devices together in a network and provide complexity across all of them so that you adjust one thing and it has all of these unintended consequences across the network, it's really hard to figure out what's happening. And the last thing is criticality. Right, so I'll talk this about this a little bit later, but you know, we just got a few days ago, like two days ago, DHS released the first public national critical functions list, like 49 functions that are critical. You know, that's 49 functions, all of which have some relation to IT that are critical to our ability to eat, drink, breathe, and survive as a nation or as a global economy. We're getting, you know, if, if my home network goes out right now, I'm in a world of hurt, right? Because everything depends on the internet. I tried, literally a decade ago, I tried to check into a hotel in San Francisco, and they had an IT problem, and they couldn't check people in, couldn't check people out. They said, go away and come back. I asked them, when? They said, we don't know. They wrote down my phone number on a sheet of paper. And so they were going to text me when it was possible to check in or check out. They had no paper backups. 
So ever since then, I've measured internet or cyber disruptions in terms of pints, because I went to the chieftain just down the road in San Francisco, and that was a two-pint, a two-pint disruption. Um, so connectivity, complexity, criticality. Which of those things are we going to put a negative delta on? Which of them are we going to reduce? Zero. We are not going to put a negative delta on any of these things. I did a, um, an interview, this must have been seven or eight years ago, with some people from the World Economic Forum who wanted to know when we were going to get to the place that something bad enough happened that people stopped putting IT in everything. And I just laughed. I, I literally laughed into the phone because we're never going to get there. The value of doing this, of these multifunctional devices, is just too great. And so, you know, when that bad thing happens, the Cyber 912 or whatever you want to call it, we're going to, you know, we're going to say, oh, you know, it's just a flesh wound, my arm's off. And we're going to keep going, walking around without an arm. Because we can't, we've gotten to the point where we can't even go back. I wrote a blog in, um, a couple of years ago as a joke. If you, if you literally, you can do this, you can go back and read it if you want. If you take the numbers of the amount of harm from cybercrime, uh, that you took, say, the FBI numbers back in 2008, 2009, and you measure what the predictions that are happening every year, right? Now, this is kind of ridiculous, but I'm going to tell you, it's, it's a totally bad math. But if you take that out and then you say that's going to extend, the entire world economy will be destroyed by cybercrime in about 2025. We will not eat, we will produce nothing, nothing will happen. Now, that's not going to happen, but things are going to continue to get worse. So then... What do we need to do about that? And that's one of the things I wanted to hear, talk to you guys about today. So I'm conscious that I am preaching to the converted, right? You know, I'm, I'm not out there talking to a bunch of dry cleaners. You guys are deeply involved in this, and I worry that I'm going to tell you nothing that you don't know. But I'm going to do my best to tell you what I think and how we approach this. And I'd love to have some questions and comments at the end to see what your thoughts are on. I'm just... Do I have a timer? Ah, I see it there. All right. So, um, Chris Inglis. You guys know Chris Inglis? A bunch of you do, right? Former Deputy Director of NSA. One of the smartest people I've ever met. You know, for those of you who know Chris, Chris can talk for about five minutes in a single sentence, outlining an entire set of things, and then he'll give a talk and it will line up with that exactly. It is just the thing that the man's head can hold is unbelievable. Uh, Chris used to like to say the key to network security is you need a network that can be defended and is adequately defended. It's really that simple, right? So let's translate that to the internet. We need an internet that can be defended and an internet that is adequately defended. So I'm going to take those in the two pieces. What is an internet that can be defended? Well, I like to call this, you know, you, you, got, you might remember the TWC approach years ago from Microsoft where one of them, the trustworthy computing, one of the planks was secure by default. So my approach to an internet that can be defended is secure by near default. Because secure by default is it's something I love. We all want secure by default. Um, but we can't get there sometimes. So we need secure by near default, where we ask, you, you know, we ask you to flip a switch. We ask you to make one right choice that you're capable of making. We take the burdens away as much as possible. So when we say secure by near default, what are we talking about? We're talking, first off, when people think about that, they mostly think about devices, right? So you buy an IoT device that doesn't have a hard encoded password for admin, admin, right? Or something else that is easily searchable. And that's all right, that's a part of it. But it's bigger than that. And it's not just devices, it's services too. I like to say, one of the things that people talk about on the internet is you know, we need to do a lot more awareness raising. We need to teach people to fish or teach them to farm. You know, that's a popular analogy. We need to make it easier for people to do this. And we don't need to do that. We need to stop trying to teach dry cleaners to fish. We need to give them food, right? 
And so this is a part of giving people food. It's giving them what they need to get the job done with all the pieces turned on. So what does that mean? What does that mean for devices? It means a bunch of things. It means it's got to come out of the box securely configured. It means it's got to be automatically updated. Right? Those are the big ones. What does it mean for services? For services, it means that when you get a service, you get security with the service, embedded as a part of the service. Either, you know, it's like you get connectivity, you, from the, you, you hook up to an ISP and you get things like essentially a clean pipe or something else. If you use a DNS service, that DNS comes with security enabled. If you're using an HR service, it's got all of the controls built into it. You know, so I know we have the Center for Internet Security out there. We're a big fan of them. They're, we have to be because they're one of our founders. Um, but we would be anyway, right? You know, people like Tony Sager are also God's gift to information security. Um, so we got to look at the things like the most critical of the top 20 critical controls to make sure that we're covering those right pieces. Um, we need to do that because broad, wide-scale vulnerability reduction is one of the only ways to tackle scale and complexity, right? If you're trying to defend an internet where half of the devices on the internet are compromised, you will fail. You know, it just won't work. Think about all of the DDoS attacks we had, for example, on DEN and um, uh, Krebs and all of those folks, right? We're seeing one terabyte attacks. If you can knit together all of these compromised devices and throw up more than a terabit a second um, against the device, it's coming down, right? And if you put enough of those together, at and is coming down, Verizon's coming down, BT's coming down. That's just too much bandwidth. Um, and there's no way to knit all of these things together for a secure strategy unless we have broad scale vulnerability reduction, which goes to the second prong. The second prong is, is adequately defended. So um, is adequately defended is a problem, right? Because we're dealing with scale, we're dealing with a lot of things, and guess what? People don't scale. You can't solve cybersecurity problems with people. You must have good people, right? And for the one percenters, which probably almost all of you are, you know, you're all one percenters, you're the highest of the highest, and you guys get owned a lot, right? For those, for you folks, people are really important, and it's good to have smart people anywhere. But if you think a dry cleaner or a fast food franchise is going to hire a CISO capable of defending their networks, then I've got a bridge for you for sale in Brooklyn that you would be very interested in making a down payment on. Um, so that's not going to work. Um, we need to come up with an approach that automatically defends these people. And in this regard, it, one of the things you hear on the internet a lot, you hear, I would say, in this space a lot, is the good guys have to be right all the time, and the bad guys have to be right only once. Okay, that's a lie. That's not true. I mean, that's what defense in depth is all about, right? You don't have to be right all the time. But it remains true that on the internet, offense wins. It's easier to attack than it is to defend. The attackers have almost all of the advantages, and we built up in entire strategies like the, um, like the kill chain model that are designed to layer multiple defenses so you can try and undercut those advantages the attacker has. So I'm going to say something. Some of you may have heard me say this before. I think it's still somewhat controversial. I believe the defenders have only one advantage. And the advantage the defenders have is the size of the network. Okay, you're looking at me saying, Phil, you said connectivity, complexity, criticality. You said that the size of the network is a danger. Well, it is. But if you use the network the right way, you've got a capability that the defenders can't match. If you have done widespread vulnerability reduction, you've got a huge distributed computing platform that can observe and respond to attacks. If you have built out an automated response mechanism. If you have deployed integrated automatic cyber defense, or what does the IA and the stand for? Adaptive. adaptive. That's even better than automatic. Integrated adaptive cyber defense. 
That's what we need, right? We need to drive that. I want some of that, right? So, two pieces, right? Secure by near default and integrated adaptive cyber defense, automated response. Everything comes down to those two things, not for the one percenters. The one percenters need kill chain and miter attack and yada, 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 yada. They need all that stuff. Everybody else, almost everybody around the world needs secure by near default and automated adaptive cyber defense. So, um, I'm going to talk now. I'm going to switch grains a little bit. I, I've, oh, by the way, none of this should be new to you. So, if you go to the IACD website, which I recommend, it's a superb website. Everybody should look at it every other day. Um, <laughs> you will find a paper written by the Department of Homeland Security in <laughs> March of 2011. You laugh. You laugh. But it's still an awesome paper. Um, and I didn't write it. Um, I confess that I had it written, which is what you do in government, right? When you're at a senior level, you don't do bupkis. You know, you have bupkis done for you. Um, so it proposes that for integrated adaptive cyber defense, you need three things. You need automation, because we have to resp respond to attacks at internet speed. You need interoperability, because the only barriers to collaboration must be those we impose by policy and not those that are imposed on us by the network and our technology. And you need authentication, because every action on the internet Every action on the internet is action at a distance. Even when you are typing in your computer, that software is at a distance from you. And unless we can strongly authenticate everything we need to, we can't make effective decisions. Those are the three building blocks for an integrated adaptive cyber defense. Now, I'm not going to drill into that too much. Read the paper. I'm happy to argue it, but I feel pretty comfortable that a paper that was written by DHS almost 10 years ago, um, my clock is, no, it hasn't. Boy, I'm going fast. Uh, 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 I don't think that's right, by the way. Um, I've been talking longer than 13 minutes, haven't I? Oh, all right. So we'll have lots of time for questions, because I'm burning through this. Um, <clears throat> the, that a paper written by DHS nearly 10 years ago still is that effective. And that you, it aligns with what I think. I believe that. I'm happy to talk about that. And by the way, that paper, which focuses on those three things, also talks about the need to make devices more secure, which is what I said before about secure by near default. Right? So the, the overall strategy's been the same. Well, what's the problem? Well, the problem is we haven't done it. I mean, we've done it. You guys, you folks, men and women, you've all been working on this sort of stuff, right? You wouldn't be at the integrated cyber conference from the integrated adaptive cyber defense organization unless you believed in automated defense. Well, maybe you could be a critic and you just want to get ammunition, but I don't think so. So you're here. You're a part of, you know, you're a part of the wash, right? You're the fraternity and the sorority that are working to make this real. But we haven't made a difference. So I'm going to talk a little bit, and I, I apologize. This is not intended to be a commercial for my organization. Um, what I want to do is tell you how we, at the Global Cyber Alliance, have worked to attack these issues and how we ended up where we are. Right? So um, I left government, I went to Sony, I did some individual consulting, and then I had a chance to join a nonprofit and help design what that nonprofit does. And I was talking to the people involved in it, and I said, well, you know, I'm really passionate about two things. I'm passionate about doing things and I'm passionate about measuring effectiveness of cybersecurity. Because if you can't measure something, you don't know if it works or not. The do something part comes from something, um, Scott Charney, a lot of you probably know Scott Charney. He, he was at Microsoft, he was the chief security officer effectively there for years. Before that, he was at Pricewaterhouse, and before that, he was the guy who originally hired me at the computer crime and intellectual property section, but back then was the computer crime unit. 
Um, so he was the leader of that section, who, by the way, got that job because a higher-level DOJ person was walking through the hall and saw him with a DOS screen open up on his computer, and so knew he was an expert. <laughs> um, turns out, um, bad evidence, but correct. Um, so that's all good. Um, but Scott used to say, the most important cybersecurity strategy is to do something. And if it doesn't work, do something else, right? Which led to the mantra, what drives GCA, which is do something, measure it. That's what we try to do. Do something, fail, fast, fail or fail fast. If you're going to fail fast, if you're going to fail. Try not to fail. But if you're going to fail, fail fast, and then do something else. Um, the third part of that that's not in the mantra is you know, scale, right? Do something, measure it, scale the solution if it works. So our approach is to figure out how to do this. Now, here's a really interesting part about how GCA came about, um, or what we've done. We wanted to go out and say, we're going to do things, and then we're going to measure if they're successful, right? But embedded in measure it is that you're actually making a difference, right? I've built something, and it turns out to work, and now I'm not going to do anything with it, right? That's, that's effectively the same approach that you'd get out of, you know, a think tank. Um, and I don't mean to run down think tanks. Think tanks are wonderful. They do great work. There's a lot of people out there working policy and recommendations, right? But there's always a risk of shelfware, right? And think tanks are not innately suited to implement what they do. Right? So we with GCA said, well, we need to implement this. We need to drive global deployment. Right? So if you're going to try to do that, you've actually got to worry about scale. You've got to worry, does this scale? And you can't just say, do something, measure it, scale, unless at the very start of the process, you have picked a do something that will scale, right? So, for example, I could say, train everyone not to click on link and phishing emails. Really good thing to do, right? So I'll do that, I'm gonna train people. I could train a few people. I could measure how successful, and I guarantee you, I guarantee you if I measure those people, they were going to be less likely to click on phishing links, right? But then I get to scale. How do I train everybody in the world? I can't, because people don't scale. What's more, even if I train all of them, you know, the biggest expert in the world is still every so often going to click on a link in a phishing email. It's just going to happen because people make mistakes. Right? So when I think about scale, I have to think about scale not just at the end, but the beginning. So let's pick a scalable solution. Let's measure it. And then let's try to deploy it at scale. Now let's go back to what I said at the start about if you really want to have an effect at scale, you need to have secure by near default, and you need to have integrated adaptive cyber defense. Right? So what that means is I, we, the members of the Global Cyber Alliance, unknowingly built an implementation organization that specifically worked on these things, those two things, something that I've started to call internet immunity secure by near default, and integrated adaptive cyber defense. So I'm going to go through a few of the projects that we've done and talk about what our approach is, and then I'm happy to sort of, I'll close and I'll, I'll answer questions, because it looks like we'll have at least 15 minutes um, to answer questions if you want to talk about any of this. So the first thing we did was work on a protocol called DMARC or a technology called DMARC, or whatever you want to call DMARC, a standard called DMARC. Who in the room is familiar with DMARC? Eh, half, maybe, right? So um, DMARC is a way of stopping direct domain spoofing in its tracks. So it, it relies on two other protocols, SPF and DKIM, so that you essentially, it's server-to-server it's -server authentication the sending email server through SPF and DKIM signs an email that says, this actually came from an authorized sender associated with this domain. 
And DKIM says it hadn't been changed. It's a valid copy of this email. So the recipient email server, because those, those records are published in DNS, in the public DNS records, can look at the email when it comes in and say, is this an authorized email? And is it a valid email? And if it is, it can let it through. DMARC lays on top of those, and DMARC lets the owner of that domain specify what to do with emails that fail. So um, Microsoft, Dot com, which has deployed DMARC, um, could say, this is what I want you to do with the email. I want you to send it to trash. Um, and any recipient that has deployed DMARC on the receiving end would enforce that policy. So DMARC's got to be deployed on the sending email server and the receiving email server. But if it is, and if it's properly deployed by the sender, it really stops direct domain spoofing in its tracks. And a bank could effectively prevent completely, for anyone who had deployed DMARC on the receiving end, the sending of email that appeared to be from the bank, that said it was from bank.com. Um, I know there's somebody on bank.com. Please strike that from the video. Um, <laughs> some bank um, could, could stop email from going to its customers and stealing data. Super effective. Um, and the, the best part about this is the biggest, well, not the biggest, one of the biggest scaling problems has already been done, right? So you needed to deploy this at scale on the sending end and on the receiving end. Before we even got involved, the scale on the receiving end had mostly been solved, at least for consumers. Because all of the big webmail providers like Microsoft, Google, um, Yahoo, they've all deployed DMARC, right? So if you're a consumer, You've got secure by actual default, not even secure by near default. You get it and you get DMARC turned on. So there was a lot of problems, though, on the sending end. How do we get people to deploy it? Because you look even at banks, and banks are at about 20%. The US federal government, I mean, it would just be rounding error bad, right? There were like two or three domains that had it deployed at some level. Um, so we said, let's, how do we change this? So the first thing is um, we wanted to attack this first through the secure by near default approach. And we can't do at the start secure by default. I can't wave a switch and have everybody turn on DMARC when they get email from their hosting provider. I want to do that eventually, but I can't do that right now. So we wanted to remove barriers to use of DMARC. So we built a wizard that did a couple of things. One, it, unlike, there are some other wizards out there, but unlike any one at the time, I believe, um, it did both SPF and DKIM. And the other thing that was different about it, even if anything did SPF and DKIM as well, is it's available in 18 different languages, right? So you can protect yourself. You can, you can find out how to deploy DMARC, what your DS record ought to look like to deploy it. If you are a company in Russian, like two versions of Chinese, Japanese, Malay, Spanish, most of the European languages, so that anybody can in their native language, or most people can deploy it. Um, so this has been really effective, what we've done so far. We've had about 7,500 domains use that wizard to turn on DMARC, but let's go back to the, the really significant problem, the scale problem, right? 7,500 domains, we feel really good about that. We've actually done, uh, in the measure category, we've done an analysis of how much money that saved, and it's super significant. Or the, the loss of, re based on um, the reduction in business email compromise from the people who deployed it, our quants calculated a really significant return on investment for the companies that did that. But the problem is that the numerator is 7,500. The denominator is the internet, right? And the internet is a big denominator, right? So <clears throat> we've done great training, we've done all this, how do we get it to scale? Um, couple of points. Incentives and requirements and expectations are really important. So the big thing that we work on is the expectations point. So we want to get to DMARC global deployment by making it not a best common practice, not a best practice, but a best common practice. So that everybody really does it or they're kind of out of the loop. Um, one of the great things that started this is that 
the UK government, you know, I, I've seen um, one of the things up there said active cyber defense. I think it was Dark Light, one of the sponsors here, right? The UK strategy, the NCSC, the National Cybersecurity Center strategy in the UK, is all about um, automatic cyber defense, um, active measures, those sorts of things. Um, the UK government was the first government in the world to require all federal civilian agencies to deploy DMARC. Um, uh, I believe that that's the right strategy. Um, when the new administration came on board, I was knocking on Rob Joyce's and Jeanette Manfred's door as soon as I could to say, you guys really ought to deploy DMARC. Um, and the reason is, you don't have to spend money, right? You've just got to say, federal agencies, do it. They ought to be able to do it out of hide, and it'll actually save the money, and it'll protect the people of the United States who will not get fished by email from their government. Um, now, I was not the only person doing that. People within the departments were doing that, and it turns out other people from other governments had suggested this was the same. So this met, this overall approach met with a fertile review. And by the way, if you don't know the people, you know, if you don't know Rob Joyce or Jeanette Manfred or Chris Krebs, they're all really good people. And they are working, they were working, Rob's in back at the NSA now, um, but they all did an awesome job. Uh, so this all came out in what's called BOD, Binding Operational Directive 1801, that then required the federal government across the federal civilian agencies to deploy DMARC at the highest policy level, which is called reject. Um, that had a, made a huge difference. Now over 75% of federal civilian domains have deployed DMARC. You're much less likely to get fished by your federal government. And because of legislation, those sorts of requirements now flow through to the Department of Defense as well, the NDAA from last year. So the DOD's got to do this as well. Now, so that's one approach is to try and, and get, to do this in chunks, right? To go back, to get folks like hosting providers to do this, to get governments to put their, you know, to put their footsteps where their mouths are and actually do this internally. Um, so you clearly need incentives in this space. So I want to talk a little bit about the power of CNN. Um, and I, this is true of any network, but CNN is actually the best example here. So um, first example, um, we were following the deployment of these technologies across the federal government. Um, and everybody was doing okay early on, except for one entity. Um, one part of the US federal government, the, the executive branch, that was kind of falling behind and not doing anything. And, and that was the White House. <laughs> so White House has about 26 domains, and um, it really wasn't doing much. And we watched it, we waited, we watched it. And finally, they, they did a little bit, and we, you know, we'd given enough time, so we did a study. And we talked about what the White House had done around deployment of DMARC. And within 10 days, they'd more than doubled their deployment, because it was in the press. Another example, this is specifically a CNN story. So, um, uh, Donnie O'Sullivan, who's a writer for CNN um, on the website, did a uh, report on a study we'd done about use of DMARC by federal presidential campaigns. Um, and this is really cool. Um, so, your presidential campaigns are really important places to deploy DMARC because they're sending out email all the time, right? And if you don't have DMARC deployed, your supporters can get fished, and somebody can even spoof email from you. So, if you wanted to do a dirty trick, you know, you could say, you know, Jane Doe, candidate for president, uh, wants to do this horrible thing. She wants to invade Canada. Um, and isn't that nutty? So let's not support Jane Doe. Um, so we did this study and we found that, again, very few of the presidential campaigns had deployed DMARC. So um, CNN started calling all of the presidential campaigns to get their comment before. In under 24 hours, a huge chunk of them, comparatively, had deployed DMARC at at least the basic level, um, right? So you can say name and shame is a bad strategy, but sometimes naming and shaming works. Um, it can be really important. So that's one of our approaches. We did DMARC. Um, let's see where I am. Okay, I'm going to go quickly now. Um, 
The next big thing we did was a project called Quad9. So who in here is familiar with protective DNS services or DNS firewalls? Not as many. Okay, a few. You're a genius, sir. Um, so protective DNS is really cool, right? Everybody uses DNS for all these things. You know, malware usually calls out through DNS. Turns out, as a part of secure by near default and automated cyber defense, you can protect people through DNS. All you do is you put threat data into DNS. So if a device, piece of software, or a person by clicking on an email calls out to a known bad domain, you can say it doesn't exist, right? And the best part about this is once you set up your DNS server, whether you're an individual or a company, it's completely transparent to you. You're just protected. And so if you get enterprise-grade threat intelligence and you put it into this service, you can get enterprise-grade defense deployed at scale around the world for, you know, the marginal cost of each individual user is effectively zero. Because um, once you build the infrastructure, it can spread more broadly. Um, this is a technology, we're not the only ones who do this, right? There are commercial alternatives, um, CrowdStrike, uh, VeriSign, um, a lot of ISPs, they have commercial services that do this. But it's not broadly deployed, especially among folks like individuals and smaller companies. We thought, why is that? So we built a global service with our partners, Packet Clearinghouse and IBM, that does this. It's called Quad9, and it's called Quad9 because it operates on 9.9.9.9, like 8.8.8.8 or 1.1.1.1, right? Um, but unlike a lot of other stuff, it's a protective DNS service. So it's kind of like the way OpenDNS was. It may still be, but I'm not sure OpenDNS is free anymore. Um, I'd leave that to you guys to figure out. But it's a free service that puts in protective DNS. It's really fast. It's great. It's around the world. But we wanted it to be usable by anywhere. We wanted it deployable at scale, regardless of legal barriers. So, or people concerned about privacy. So the way Quad9 works is it doesn't collect personally identifiable information. It's not just privacy sensitive. It does not collect personal data. So the, when you call out to, uh, to do a domain lookup, the, your IP address we, we do save metadata around the calls to bad domains because we need to do analysis, right? But that metadata is not saved around the IP address of the source domain. It's saved around the geolocation data, not below the city level of the source domain. So we can do analytics, we can do all of that sort of stuff, but I can't tell you if you're using Quad9 whether you clicked on a link in a phishing email or not. I can just tell you somebody in Washington, D.C. or Columbia, Maryland did. And so... That means that there's a free service that's really effective, available around the world. And I'll tell you how effective it is. We had, I have 10 minutes. We had one US state that used this in its, um, in its uh, beta form. And they said that when they turned on what was then not Quad9, but became Quad9, it reduced their antivirus hits by half and their intrusion detection system hits by a third, okay? So that's a damn good, that's a technical term, damn good ROI for free. Um, and it leave, we, this leaves open an entire commercial set of possibilities that doesn't undermine the commercial space. Because if you use a commercial service, they can tell you so much more. They can tell you who's clicking on LinkedIn phishing emails. They can tell you if you've got via machines. We can't tell you that because we don't know. Because we built the service not to know. We built it to scale and the one percenters who, people who can pay for the service can and ought to pay for the service if they want to use it. Um, so we built it with that in mind. The latest effort that we did, I'm going to close out after this, is we built a cybersecurity toolkit for small business. Um, so this is also a secure by near default initiative. Um, here's the problem with small businesses. They're super critical, right? They're a majority of the world economy. They make up 99% or more of businesses, right? And what's available for them? Well, there's free tools out there. Yeah, sure. Um, and there's awesome guidance. I mean, you go to a place like the National Cybersecurity Center in the UK or the Federal Trade Commission or DHS or the National Cybersecurity uh, or NCSA, sorry. I mean, a lot of other places, you can get awesome guidance for small businesses, right? And that's super good stuff. We don't need to do that. We don't need to do guidance. What's the net effect of that? It's pretty small. And the reason it's pretty small 
is the small business reads guidance, and they go, oh, this is interesting. I mean, if they read guidance, right? If they read guidance, then they say, well, I, what, what do I do? Uh, you know, throw it out. Move on, right? They don't have any capacity. This goes back to the don't teach them to fish, give them food point. Um, so, we wanted to build something that would not be perfect because it would not be a pure secure by default. It would be secure by near default. What we did was we, we didn't take just our tools. We took a whole bunch of tools that are available from across the entire ecosystem, from multiple providers, and we built it into a toolkit. So, a small business is given six toolboxes to go through, which has both the guidance and the free tool you can use to implement the guidance right there with, to the best we can do it right now, step-by-step -step instructions about what to do. The goal being it's a cybersecurity cookbook for a small to medium-sized business as opposed to guidance. A cookbook that comes with all the utensils you need to implement it, right? It's still, you know, it's not designed for Gordon Ramsay. Um, it's designed for someone who ha can't make MasterChef Junior yet. Um, now, we got a long way to go to get there. You know, there's, this is a, an initial effort, but it's out there and it's freely available. And we've already announced that we're working, we'll release soon, a cybersecurity toolkit that uses the same approach, but it involves more tools for elections bodies. Um, so that's kind of an approach. That's a secure by near default. In the long term, what do we want to do with this? We want to move it all so you get all of that stuff. So you don't have to use the toolkit. You, you buy cloud services and you get the stuff embedded in the cloud. So that's how we do this. We've got other projects. I'm not going to go through all the other projects. I wanted to close with um, one final thought. So um, I mentioned before that earlier this week, DHS released the National Critical Functions List, or the Critical National Functions List. Which is the acronym? I don't know. Doesn't matter. Part Critical National Functions List? CNFL. Um, got to get that NFL in there with the draft and everything. Um, so um, it's, got, it's, a, it's a good list, right? It's a really good list. And I strongly support the approach of DHS in moving away from exclusively sectors more towards national functions. Um, and the reason, not that sectors are not important. Sectors are very important for peer sharing and joint activity and all those sorts of things. But at the end of the day, if you look at sectors, you miss all the interrelationships. You miss all of the things that are important globally. Um, so that's, you know, that's a really good thing to do. But the problem is you can miss, you can, you know, if, you, if you have sectors on the brain, you can miss a lot around national critical functions. If you have critical functions on the brain, that's all you're thinking about, it's easy to miss those things like those small and medium-sized businesses, right? Particularly if they're a small part but a critical part of a big supply chain that leads to a national critical function. Um, it's easy to think about the big players doing the big things. And um, I was worried, I want to make sure that as we go forward that DHS does not ignore those small entities. And you know, I am very pleased to say that when, got it, when, when Chris Krabs, the director of CISA, testified on the Hill, I think yesterday, maybe the day before, he specifically called out the need to look at things like small businesses that are critical parts of supply chain in his answer to a question. So DHS gets it. I know that's a shock to some people, right? Uh, but it shouldn't be. I mean, there's some super smart people doing really, really great work there. So it's time we brought up our understanding of DHS to affect the current reality as opposed to 2003 when it was an agency just forming. And they're doing really effective things. I do remain concerned, though, and I, one of the things I want to make sure we do on the national critical functions list is not forget about the small and medium-sized businesses and other entities, the broad scale of the internet that don't roll up to national critical functions, right? It's nice to have these 49-odd critical functions, right? But delivering food to people is a critical function only if there are people to deliver food to. Um, and they've got money, and they're running small businesses. So there's a global economic effect that makes small businesses critical that makes scale and complexity critical as a part of risk management, doing broad risk buy-downs, even if apparently unrelated to national critical functions, that I think is essential and I hope DHS does not forget. So that's kind of who we are and what we do. I will say, you know, I'm, 
everything I said, I don't, I don't speak off the record for the most part. Um, so, you know, I know this is going to be taped, but feel free to quote, tweet, comment, ask me questions. I'm happy to do any of those things. Um, you can find me on Twitter. You can find GCA on Twitter. I'm on LinkedIn. And I'm, I'm pretty open and easy to reach. I hope you guys will all stay um, in touch. And I look forward to talking with you for the rest of the day. And with that, I have three minutes and 20 seconds to answer questions. Come on. Some quick rules of the road for questions. Please come to the microphones to ask your questions. Uh, since we are recording, I want to make sure those are recorded and people can understand what your questions are. But can, I, can I just jump out of order? This very nice lady here gave me a lot of feedback during the talk, and she wanted to ask a question, so I wanted to ask her first. Yes. Um, just, to repeat the just to repeat the question, do you have an example of a positive tactic rather than shaming organizations into adopting cybersecurity approaches? Positive incentives work better um, than negative incentives do. Naming and shaming is never as good. Um, so uh, p companies respond to positive incentives. I will give you, this is, these are both Future-looking examples. You want companies to disclose cybersecurity incidents. So give them a real safe harbor. Say, if you disclose under these conditions, you will not be held liable. Not, we won't use your data against you, which is what we do right now. But you will not be held liable for yada, yada, yada. Or like, you know, future incidents, coming, whatever it is. You will find everybody discloses everything all the time because they want their safe harbor. You want to protect small businesses? I'll tell you how to do that. And I was just talking with somebody this morning. Have the Department of Defense say that if you small business, we're not going to ask you to do all this crap we ask Lockheed Martin and all the defense contractors to do, because you're never going to do that, right? We want you to do, like we did with the cybersecurity toolkit, these 10 things, right? These hygiene-related things. And if you do that as a part of a DOD contract, we're going to give you a percent or a half a percent on top of that. Rounding error in the national defense budget. Massive change, I bet you, overnight. And not only on DOD, but for all the other people that got that. It's got broad ecosystem effect. I, you know, I don't want to say naming and shaming is the best. Naming and shaming is not. But naming and shaming is pointed and direct, right? So if you want to drive behavior change, think about real money and the survival of businesses. And you will get immediate effect. Um, sorry, Miss. Oh, there's a question, Mr. Rocksmith. I think you've got to go back. <laughs> but I'll, I'll. Sorry, are you David? Does this work? No. Yes. Hey, cool. Uh, Good yeah. stuff. Um, I'm interested to get your thoughts on non-technical vulnerabilities at scale. Uh huh. Uh, for example, nation-state social media campaigns, misinformation, that kind of thing. So that's tough. Um, you know, there are. The only way I know to tackle that, and I don't have a good answer for you yet, is to build resilient and secure ecosystems. Um, and I think how we're going to do that around misinformation is to be determined. Um, I would just say you know, um, the internet combined with gerrymandering, I'm getting off base here, but I'm going to get on my butt somewhere, has put unbelievable pressures on our democracy. Because we've got a gerrymandered environment that has created a um, high degree of polarization between our political representatives. And then we've got an internet that enables people to only listen to what they want to hear. Right? And so we've, you know, it's actually one of the reasons I think the IACD approach is so important. What we've lost is community. Right? And so, when we talk about technical security, we've got to talk about community defense. When we talk about non-technical security, it is also about community defense. It is coming together. You know, we are all much more powerful as a group of people that work together, including with our devices or our devices working together alone. So generally across the board, I think that's the right approach. Do I have any time for questions? Or? We got time for these last two questions. Okay. 
Phil, thank you. Great talk. Uh, you're talking about the, uh, the positive effects and, the, and, and making the scale and impact, right? Have you thought about the, uh, the incentives around cyber insurance and, and how we can use that as an uh, instrument to use and incentivize uh, industries? Sure. And, and the answer is yes. I will tell you I think this answer is finally changing. Um, I first heard cyber insurance and people saying cyber insurance was going to be the savior for us literally when I came in in 1995. Um, back then it was Ty Saglo at AIG at the time. Um, and for the longest time, I mean, for literally 20 years, that dog would not hunt. Um, the, we, ha we are getting to a place where insurance can make a significant difference. But for insurance to make a significant difference, we've got to really double down on the measure it part. You know, we've got to know what works at scale and what doesn't. What are the effective protections? Because if you know the data, if you can make scientific decisions, as opposed to religious decisions. You know, if, if you're just saying, if you're assigning rates based on what everybody does or, you know, based on your gut level medieval barber thoughts about, you know, what's dangerous and what's not, you know, then you're going to require people to be bled, right, before you give them insurance. That's not going to help. Um, but if we know what they ought to do, we can have them do it. And I think that's going to start to drive change. The problem right now is the way cyber insurance is sometimes implemented is it's a way to cover for the fact that you don't have actual security. Right? And that's, that's, the, that's the negative effect right now of cyber insurance in the supply chain or in third party risk management is I won't make you change your security, just get cyber insurance. Right? And so none of our, our risk isn't dropped at all, all we've done is risk transference. Yes, sir. Bill, what should DHS be doing to help raise the level of state, local, tribal, and territorial, where everybody's at a different level of maturity and different levels of governance and different people, people in charge? So I, I will say there are a couple of things. I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a part of the overall strategy, right? The overall strategy is, among other things, secure by near default, right? So that's one of the things that we're particularly looking at and whether we can provide a similar capability like we've done with small businesses for those specific customers. Um, the second set is a broader response in terms of, I think those customers, for those customers, we as a society need to do what the federal government is trying to do for itself, um, which is get away from everybody's got their own IT and cybersecurity department towards shared services and cloud services. Because that's the only way this works at scale. It's another secure by near default and automated response point. It's the same basic thing, but saying we're going we're to aggregate and we're going to do this in a professional way and we're going to do it at scale. And so, you know, I think offering shared services with a central bearing of the costs and a cost discounting is the most effective way to approach those types of entities. The same, same thing for schools. You know, there's a bunch of there's a bunch of user sets in the you know Wendy Nather likes to talk about the cybersecurity poverty line, um, and I love that right. You know, my comms people hate it when I say the cybersecurity poverty line because it implies that um, I'm sorry one of my comms people is looking at me um, the that that you know people are below the poverty line. But the fact is that very few people can afford what they need to be able to do in cybersecurity. And the only way we're going to give them services is if we give them food. You know, we give them the services and they say, you can be insecure if you want, but if you just take what you get, if you take what the ecosystem, what the cloud gives you, you're secure. And I know that's not particularly insightful, but it's all I got. I mean, I, I, <laughs> it goes back to the way I said, we know what we need to do, we just have to do it. And so um, I think that's it. <laughs>